what is that? How can you have a nation that doesn't have a myth then, but has a kind of amorphous but strangely powerful connection? I think the myth is involved with the land, and I think that that's what it is, and I think that's what was so attractive about Diefenmaker's idea of North. This is a great empty piece of real estate for the most part, and I think we understand that, the emptiness of it, the strangeness of it, and that it is a place where other people can be welcomed in uh, to fill it slowly. I, I think that's what, it, what it's about. And we have to recognize who came in, who, who did fill this land. Uh, the, the kind of, it wasn't this rush of people coming into New York and then going into the ghettos and then spreading out and inventing a pharmaceutical company. It wasn't like that at all for us. It was, it was a difficult land to live in apart from little bits of it, you know, in BC and southern Ontario. And I think that, that the sense of, of occupying this space, this difficult space, has in fact colored uh, what we are. What is my country? It's winter. I mean, we know that, don't we? That's, that's what's been said about it. And that has given us a start. And, and the fact that waves of immigrants have come in, that I don't feel, I, I lived here since 61, I say that I'm a Canadian. I know that I was born somewhere else. And I suppose I could say, yes, I'm sort of British Canadian, but I, it's given me an opportunity to to say thank you very much, thank you for taking me in. I, 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 this is a wonderful thing. I don't feel that I would have been taken in in the same way in the States. I would have had to join in somehow and become what they are. But there's a different thing here which says, okay, come in. This is the idea of it, I believe, and bring what you can, do what you can. It's very. This is an open society, and it is. It's a caring society. You still expect Canadians to say thank you and please. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing to have happened. I could see that it was opportunity here, and it was a wonderful opportunity. And my opportunity was, because I was in the theatre, was to create mirrors. Now, my interest was always in acting. I, I was fascinated by how do you deliver something? How do actors work? How do, and a kind of excitement on the stage. Uh, what is this about? What grabs an audience? And it has to be about a person moving. I mean, I believe that theatre is just three things. It's an idea, it's an actor, and it's an audience. That's it. And I, I say this when I talk to kids or anything. But it can be as simple as juggling. Somebody juggling. The idea is to keep three balls in the air at the same time. Somebody has to do it. Somebody watches it. That's, that's, that's theatre because the ball might fall, you know. Um, so it's, it, there's a tension in the air. Or it can be as complicated as putting on Hamlet or, or, or something else. Now, what I lived through was creating a way of doing Hamlet. Like, my first job was with Canadian players. I was so lucky on that. 1961 in Toronto, I was going to all these places. And Max Heltman, I think, had got sick or something like that. So they needed somebody to play Cassius. Cassius, can you imagine? On a six-month tour right across the country. And they, this idiot of 25 or 26, whatever I was at the time, wanders in and goes, I'm an actor and I had a job, you know. Where have you worked before? Well, I hadn't actually worked anywhere. Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I'd throw out. And um, Tony Van Bridge uh, and Gene Roberts were running the Canadian players. And they, they said, OK. Because Tony, in his autobiography, says, this thin young man appeared, and I said to Gene, my God, if he can put three words together, he's got the job, I need somebody tomorrow. So I, I was lucky, I got the job. I played Cassius and a lot of parts in St. Joan from one end of the country to the other. So I, I learned the country and I learned my craft on this bus. I played in Lynn Lake in northern Manitoba and Flin Flon and wonderful places. Uh, playing in gymnasiums in, in anywhere anywhere we played in the in the catholic uh, catholic community hall in port of basque there wasn't a motel or a hotel in port of basque when you came out of the they were building one you came out of your room you had to step across the concrete which had been poured and uh, there wasn't there wasn't anywhere to eat so they arranged that we'd get meals with this marvelous woman who cooked for us and 
in the Catholic community hall, there were people with their faces pressed to the windows outside, and it was cold in Port of Basque, just to see us doing Julius Caesar in sort of half modern dress. And there were only 10 of us, you know, we were running around the back pretending to be soldiers and things. Um, it was it was quite amazing. It was amazing to, to know Port of Basque and places right across the country, and it was amazing to actually have to connect with these people. I'm also and how was that holding a mirror up to the folks of Port of Basque, Julius Caesar? Well, I don't know what they saw, but they saw the possibility they saw the possibility that this could be interesting, people in a parallel universe, which had to do with Shakespeare. That's good. Everybody knows Shakespeare's good. Uh, this is the story of Julius Caesar. That's a myth that's in our civilization, the idea of Julius Caesar being stabbed and then it all turning to ratchet. That, that's part of our cultural myth. Everybody sort of knows that uh, or has an idea of it. And then here are people who have come from Toronto, and they're doing it for us, and there are nice voices, and we understand some of this. I, I, I'm not trying to belittle or anything, mm -hmm. but this is, I think, what was happening. And they were coming from Toronto. They weren't coming from New York. This was the Canadian players who were doing this particular production. They were actually said who we are, who are doing this. And I think that was part of, of recognizing that that culture didn't have to come from New York or London. Those, those faces pressed against the glass were watching actual Canadian artists giving us something. And that kind of stuff started it off, that you didn't have to have the cachet of, of coming from somewhere else. You could be from here and hold the mirror up. Yes, we've forgotten that so much of this country only saw touring companies that's from right. the United States or touring companies from Britain. That's and right. And that's what theatre was. That's right. Somebody and else's tour is here. That's right. So Stratford and MTC in Winnipeg and then later the Neptune and all the companies starting and Canadian players most particularly said, we can do this. Can so do Canadian this. players in 1961, was all a bus? Did you fly? Did you train? Or was a oh, bus? Oh, we did everything. We were on a bus most of the time. But uh, we had to take the, um, take the uh, what do they call it, the Newfie Bullet. I remember taking the, uh, the, the narrow gauge train because we were fogged in, I think, in Gander, so we got onto the train. I remember having a fight with one of the, turned it actually into fisticuffs, how stupid now, uh, on the train station at Gander with, with um, some other act, the company, I don't know why, we were so tense. But uh, we got on the Newfie Bullet and we made it up over breakfast. Uh, and arrived in St. John's, and St. John's, I can't tell you. I mean, I thought this was one of the most fantastic places I'd ever been in my life. St. John's, it has these wonderful little wooden houses, and going into a bar and listening to this accent, I thought this was magical. This is halfway across the Atlantic, a strange place. And newly Canadian, too. Yeah. 1961, they came in in 1949, so yeah. it's been Canadian for yeah. only 12 years. I know, I know, I know. Talk uh, about connections and putting yeah. something together. I thought, I thought this was fantastic. Uh, and did, were you billeted? Did you stay in a hotel? Uh, did you? What did we do in St. John's? Oh, no, hotel. It was an old sailor's hotel where they hadn't changed the sheets. I remember having <laughs> to go down and connect, say, look, can you change the sheets? I'm not sitting in these sheets. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <coughs> that kind of, that kind of, for me, all these places were magical in the, because it was a discovery. It was a kind of, when I say I went, in England I went to a school which would have made me a good district officer in Upper Nigeria. I took that curiosity which had been, which is part of me, it was a natural talent in me, but it was not jumped on and squashed in the kind of school I went to. It was in fact almost encouraged. Not a great deal, but it, 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 they didn't stop it. So that when I suddenly found a blank slate, or what seemed to me a blank slate mm -hmm. of a country, this was, it became more and more magical. Brandon, for me, uh, is on my, I can remember distinctly going into, uh, coming to Brandon playing, 
and going into a bookshop. Well, they didn't have a bookshop in Brandon in those days. They had a stationery store. And as in many small towns in Canada, the stationery store had a bookcase of books which they sold. Oh, God. And Brandon, even though I think it still had a university college, so it had something at the college at that time, didn't, I couldn't find a bookstore. But I remember buying from this bookcase in the stationery store the Oxford Book of Canadian Short Stories. Now, they were a bit boring. That, I think it was probably Weaver did them originally, but it wasn't very much. But I remember reading them on the bus because I wanted another mirror, what I've been talking about. And it, there wasn't enough. That it just didn't, wasn't mirroring what I saw at that time. So I got very excited by what could be done, who's writing, what's, what's happening. And Toronto was exciting in the 60s. It really was. But we had only the Alex. Well, it wasn't theatre. There were writers hacking, happening around. Right. And there were, there were poets. And when, did the, when did the Bohemian Embassy start? Late 60s? Remember mm -hmm, the Bohemian yeah. Embassy? The, yeah. uh, um, it was a coffee house, really, yeah. in which people could, could read and... 1965, 63, 65 yeah, was yeah, all starting was in there. I part of that. I lived in Yorkville. It oh, was wow. wonderful. I lived at 114 Cumberland Street. Oh, my God. Torn down now in Yorkville. And I, there were people, there were young actors of my generation who were just beginning to want to do something and, and who were trying to start little companies. And I remember when I came back from New York, uh, trying to set up a production of uh, of uh, of the knack up here, I could get the rights, you know, of it, and we could do something. And I remember calling Tony Perkins because even New York was small in those days, and his the person, his one of his great friends was happened to be my agent's sort of second in command in New York, and so I, I knew a few people around. And I remember calling Tony and saying, "Would you come up for uh, two months and play?" In something here, and he said, stage play, and I said, yes. He said, oh, that would be interesting, yes, if I could. So one was trying to do mm -hmm. something. I couldn't put it together, nobody was in, you know, nobody put up. But still, money. it sounds like you were infected by all the, the pushes and the pulls, yes, George was, Luscombe over there, and Passmorei starting over there. Yes, Passmorei it was just on the edge in the late 60s. But George Luscombe then, was already in his basement, so to speak. Yeah, by then I'd already gone out to Calgary, you see, because right in the, what had happened to me was that I'd had sort of five years at the beginning where I was playing all over the place, going out to Vancouver and anywhere that would hire me, lots of CBC work. And then, then after I'd done this thing in New York, of course Stratford get, called me. They found out there was a Canadian playing in New York. So they called me and said, will I come to Stratford? <laughs> of course I said, yes, I would. I want to go back a little bit yes. to the Canadian players. Yes. Did you travel with a set? Yes. Did you set, did the actress set up the set? Did yes. you have crew and it all fitted on a bus? Or? Yeah, it all fitted on a bus. It was a couple of screens uh, that were set up and uh, a few lights. It all fitted on a bus. So you put lights on trees in your gymnasium yes, or your church yes, hall or wherever you went. The, yeah, and two, the two, there was a stage manager and it must have been an A, no, and two ASMs and the ASM was also filled in. Canadian Players was an actor driven company? Tony well, Van Bridge, Jean Roberts, she was not an actress. No, she? no, she was the greatest manager we've ever had, I think. Uh, yes, Douglas Campbell of course started it. As, right. Uh, something to do in the winter for the Stratford actors. But you do it all. You unload the bus. Mm. The actors put up the lights. Mm. Um, Not everybody. Not everybody. Uh, <coughs> I was lucky. I didn't have to do very much hard work. It was done by Ken and Gary Crawford, I think, were our two ASMs who also acted. And the stage manager and anybody they could round up at the place where we had arrived. And how many in total were on the bus? I think 12. That's everybody? Yes, I don't think it was more than that. Maybe 13, 14 at max. Makeup? Yes, we did. Five and nine grease paint? That's right. Um, yes, mm -hmm. that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was makeup. And these strange sort of half modern dress costumes that we did both shows in, St. Joan and, uh, and Julius Caesar. It was, um, 
it demanded a leap of the imagination from the audience. But uh, the only time that I ever remember anything untoward happening in the audience and people paying uh, not paying attention was a school matinee in Nelson, D.C. Well, we had a riotous audience. The kids wouldn't listen or do anything. And the, the uh, head teacher, the principal of the high school in Nelson, came on the stage in the intermission. <laughs> I remember him now said, OK, these are our guests. We're not likely to see a professional theatre company doing Julius Caesar uh, again for, for some time in Nelson. And I want to say, if I hear another sound from you guys, I will knock your teeth down the back of your throat. <laughs> well, we don't get principals saying things like that anymore. But there was dead silence. And then, of course, we played to an audience just sitting there staring at us. Frank said anything. So it was a dead audience. It was probably better when they were making noise. But, and, OK, they shut up. And somebody in that audience heard it. That's the thing we relied on all the time. Somebody heard it.